You fire all the product managers. That's the message that I saw on LinkedIn recently. Brian Chesky, is, who is the CEO of Airbnb, went on Config 2023, Figment's conference, and he said something along the lines of, we got rid of all of our product managers, and it got a big applause from all the designers in the crowd. Since the clickbait has been making its rounds on LinkedIn, we're going to actually watch the source and react to it. It's only 20-something minutes long, so we should be able to get through it pretty quick. Om Patel, he covers the teams side and the enterprise side of the podcast. I'm Brian Orlando, I cover the products, and Curtis is back. Hey, welcome back, Curtis. Ah, so I've listened to this now a couple of times since you sent it to me. Yeah, just because I, I try to make sure because like when you first listen to something like this, you start peeling back the layers of like right. what did he actually say? Right. And there's there's a lot of good information in there. There's probably some ways that he probably expressed it with not the best wording. I I found myself thinking through what is their product like is he referring to the website that connects host to guest is he talking about the product of the house itself is he talking about a mobile app because he starts going through and say product 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 but that has never really established and that's a that's a key point there to establish when he's talking through design so just keep that in the back of your mind all right i'm going to try to put this over here and uh Let's see what we get. Brian is the CEO and co-founder of Airbnb, and I looked at the entire Fortune 500, all the CEOs, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that you are the only designer CEO in the Fortune 500. If there's another one, I'd love to meet them. You were telling me that at some point in the company journey, you sat down and realized that you were doing things in a very conventional way, yeah. despite your design training. I went to the Rhode Island School of Design with one of my co-founders, Joe Gebbia, and it was kind of crazy, the idea that a founding team would have two designers and one engineer. It was so crazy that I remember when we pitched one of our first investors, he said, we love everything but you and your idea. Just to initial reaction, first is like, he, said, he says, I'm the only designer that's a CEO. I don't know if that's accurate design thinker he's the only trained designer he went to RISD he did but anybody can be a design thinker other CEOs could think like a designer as well he's a design thinker and I think one one of the characteristics there is he is user obsessed I think that's a common term so he's he's obsessed with his user his design is focused around the end user Mm -hmm. that's something that's not often seen at least not anymore It, it used to be it's more so to make the people who write the checks happy, I think. So yeah. So he's a designer. I mean, what kind of designer is different than what I would have thought? Yeah. I would have guessed, like, back then, I it was, that was probably like when interactive design came on the set, and then it yeah. was a later called user experience designer. But Industrial design, yeah. I yeah. wasn't expecting industrial yeah. designer. So he's, he's trained in industrial design. Okay. Yeah. All right. I don't know how we're going to cut this together, but here we go. I'm, I'm going back in. I remember when we pitched one of our first investors, he said, we love everything but you and your idea. And one of the things they meant is strangers will never sleep, stay with other strangers and designers don't start companies. Okay. And at RISD, in the year 2000 when I was there, I studied industrial design. And there was this whole mantra, how do you get design in the boardroom? And Joe and I, maybe we didn't know any better. We thought, what if design just ran the boardroom? And that was the whole premise behind Airbnb. And so we had these magical ideas of what Airbnb could become. And for a moment, for a while, I felt like it was really special and magical. And then 10 years later, it's now 2019, and I wake up one day, and I have this, I have this horrible dream. And the dream is, it's as if I've been gone for 10 years, I come back to the company, and it's unrecognizable. And I said, that dream that we had, that company that would be magical, that was like an amazing product people loved, that we were starting to lose it. It was starting to wear out. I basically was a designer, and I kind of noticed there's two types of people in companies that never become CEOs. Engineers become CEOs in Silicon Valley. Marketers become CFOs. Finance people become CEOs. Operators become CEOs. But the two people that never run companies are designers and head of HR. And I started- Whoa, whoa, whoa. let me stop you right there, right quick. Uh, Because I have a testing background. I've tried. Testers. Like the, yeah, you don't see them up let me, there let me, either. So like the, the purpose of the whole story that we just listened is to, to get us to the point where he's saying, I created the company and it was a beautiful thing. And we cared about design and design was a, a, had a big stake in the boardroom. And then we grew and then like I didn't recognize the company anymore. So but, uh, one thing I don't understand is why 10 years later he couldn't recognize the company. It's not like he went away and came back. Like why they let... That happen. Well, I, I have an immediate like idea in my head, which is extreme ownership. Uh, Jocko Willink 
book. It was a great book. This is the military guy, right? Yeah. That wrote the book. Yeah. He was a Navy SEAL. In the book, he says there's so many people that when they're in command, they've got to, they feel like they got to get in and micromanage and get real close to the issue. But if you're real close to the issue, you can't see what's happening from far away. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you need to back away from the problem, like far away from the problem to get an overview of the entire situation so you can make a better decision because nobody consumed with dealing with the problem can see the whole system and that like i i know I, I'm, I'm cutting us ahead like way 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 ahead in this podcast because he's what he's about to say is hey we got in we started developing the software and we went in with this design centric approach and there was a couple of us and we, when we were all entrepreneurial that that's a that's a term right entrepreneurial yeah that's uh, Basically, you can get everybody that's involved in the company and the software into a room and talk about it. And then over time, we grew to a point where you can't do that anymore. And now nobody has a good view of the whole thing. Yeah. I don't know how he is because I haven't really dug into his background. But especially if the founders are the type of people that are like, hey, we set the roadmap. We. You, you come to me when you want to put something new on the roadmap. Only I can tell you the vision of the application. Right? And the. The, the, the feature factory PMs, like the yeah. feature factory product managers who are like, well, I don't really, I don't do a strategy. I don't do a marketing right. and pricing. Like no. the CEO just tells me, right? Especially if you're that kind of company, Middle man. then there's that kind of interplay going well, on. You said something, how did he not recognize? I think at least the way that I read into it is, is almost like you get a new puppy or you have a child and now the child's 10. There's a second when you've been on work where you've just taken a step back and say, how how in the heck did we get here? And I think that he's been so close to it for so long and he's so used to it, the gradual changes over time that have taken him so far off the path mm-hmm. is probably how he got blinded by it. The good thing is, is he recognized it, but some companies never recognize he it. He got blind yeah. to it. He, yeah, he right. got, sorry, yeah, yeah you're he right. Got he got to blind it. to it. And I think that once he removed himself and looked at it and he goes, oh my gosh, how, how did we get here? And that's how you can, it can easily just, yeah. Like that, get right away from you, and yeah, maybe maybe you need to take a step back. That's probably what opened him up. Yeah, I get that. I mean, one of the things that happened in this particular industry is in those ten years, he encountered competition. He didn't have much competition when he came out with the the concept of Airbnb at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But towards 2019, yeah, that you had these other companies that sprung up, Verbo and all these other ones, especially yeah. overseas. So I guess a savvy CEO would have to take notice. Yeah. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Yeah, I was gonna say let let's let's kick back. To- I started thinking, why is this? And I think it's because design, in some ways, is fragile, because companies are organized around the scientific method, and the creative process is something that requires nerve. And over the years, I started losing my nerve, and I brought in a lot of people from a lot of different companies, and they brought their way of working towards us. So what do we do? We had divisional, we basically divisionalized. So we had like 10 different divisions. They had like 10 different subdivisions. We were very much run by product managers. We had a plethora of AB experiments. And the thing I started noticing is the more people we added, the more projects we pursued, the less our app changed. And the more the costs went up. And I didn't know what to do. It's now late 2019, and they're like, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know because we're about to go public. And so blowing up the company before you're like, ready to go public is kind of a bad time. So I go back home for the holidays, and it's now early 2020. We're preparing to go public. And I actually, it's right before 2020, I meet two people that changed my life. Before he digs into this, what he just pointed out was the company was growing, we hired a bunch of people. They brought their way of work, like his words, they brought their way of work, meaning they changed the culture. Every hire that we brought in changed the culture slightly. The culture started changing, and now we've got all these divisions, all these basically silos throughout the organization, and the product managers jump from silo to silo, and now he comes back and he realizes, like, he doesn't like that. He doesn't like that culture. He doesn't like that division. He doesn't. He's setting himself up for a CEO-level culture slam dunk of a talk is is the way I was feeling at the early part of this talk. I was like, uh oh, preach about why not to have silos and why not to have all the people over here and all the people and all the requirements over there and all the testing over there. Like, come on, man, here we go. I Let's got see really if that's psyched. actually going to transpire in this conversation. Yeah. Well, well you, what I what I, what I liked about it was you you started to go down that path. I thought you were going to say it. It was 
He goes, one day there was all these divisions and everything. It's like, they didn't come in off the street and make that decision. You made that decision, and then you put someone in that. Right. So is it really the outside people there, or did we kind of maybe change somebody along the lines? Maybe not him, but somebody else that you had hired before you to make said decisions did make yeah, that decision. Right. Or your other better half made right. that decision. and. <laughs> Somebody did. It wasn't the people. It wasn't the product managers. It's uh, not their fault. I know we have a podcast about like, hey, yeah. at that point when you're experiencing pain, maybe somebody with an agile coaching experience can kind of help you say, hey, look, if you want to keep that small company feel, if you want to keep that that everyone working together, customer centric, customer focused feel and figure out how to scale from there, how to scale, quote, scale without scaling, without, oh, here's the pyramid and all these people are working for that and all these resources are working for that, whatever. Like maybe you bring somebody in who knows how to do that. And I mean, would they do that? I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't know if they would ever be open to that, but let's, let's keep going. Let's moving on. Move. The first person I meet is a guy named Hiroki Asai. Hiroki Asai was the creative director at Apple and he reported yeah. Steve Jobs and he worked guys. at Apple from like 1998 to 2016. Wow. And the second person I already knew, but I got reacquainted was Johnny Ive. And Johnny Ive ran design at Apple. And at that moment, I kind of forgot about the magic of this design renaissance that Steve Jobs had. And they described this company to me and the way of running a company with a design at the center, where like, it was a totally different way of running a company than everything I was taught. Everything I was taught about how you run a company was opposite of what Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive and Hiroki Shocking. did at Apple. So I hired Hiroki. Johnny had this Shocking. firm. We brought him on. He became our number one client. And now I have this idea. There's maybe a better way to run a company. But there's still a problem. We're going to go public. So what do we do? All of a sudden, I remember our business drops 80% in China. It's January 2020. And there was this thing that no one in the United States was talking about called COVID. And I remember thinking, wow, if this thing spread beyond China, it'd be really bad. Within eight weeks, we lost 80% of our business. And at that moment, I remember thinking to myself, I don't know what's going to happen if we can save the company, but how do I want to be remembered? If this Airbnb is like a burning house and I can only take half the things out of the house, what do I take with me? It suddenly was really clarifying. Like and another thing happened. I realized that for 10 years, I was apologizing about how I wanted to run the company. Because how I really wanted to run the company was as a designer. But I just didn't have the nerve. But the moment, like it was a crucible moment, we did that. So what do we do? We rebuilt the company from the ground up. We went from business unit organization to a functional organization. So we had a design department, a marketing department, an engineering department, the way every startup is run. We took all the projects in the company. First of all, I asked every leader, show me your roadmap. They couldn't even figure out their roadmaps because everyone had a sub roadmap on sub teams. And those teams had roadmaps and those teams had roadmaps. And so I said, there's a simple rule. If it's not on the roadmap, it can't ship. And it must be on one roadmap. So with this giant exercise, we put every single thing on one roadmap. I feel like I should stop here there's because that, like, it's, it's time for radical changes. He detects a problem. It just so happens it coincides with like when the company's in real trouble. Yeah, COVID. It's a great example because most companies don't get to this level of like, let's laser focus until they get into real trouble like this. Most companies have a long tail of drawing down over time as kind of like the, the, the incompetence and poor leadership and management kind of run awry. So kind of like just degrades the business over time. And it's, it's such a slow death march that you don't notice. This happened so quick, he knew I need to respond now and reforge the business the way that I would like to run it. And, and, and that's everything he's talking about now is like, well, how, what are we doing and, and how are we doing it? What are our priorities? And how come I can't see them all in one place? Like I can only imagine like department heads having their own roadmaps. Like, oh my goodness. Like, it, And it's departmentalized. It's not product. It's not product roadmaps. Right. There is roadmaps. Right. So that's what's crazy. It's like, we're going to put it all in one because I'm, I'm, I'm fairly certain maybe you could argue mobile app versus website, but the Airbnb product is the platform itself that connects guest to host. And is the, and my question is, I don't use Airbnb enough. Is there another product there or is that the product? They have different offerings, but that is the product. So it's one yeah. roadmap. It's, 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 it can be, it yeah. can be one roadmap. And at least they understood it. They, yeah. The flip side of that is the risk of having one product, right? 
all your eggs yeah, in one basket. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Yeah. So when the economy tanks, or heaven forbid, we have a pandemic yeah. that impacts guests yeah. traveling, you're going to suffer badly. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And and that's and that's what it took because you see every other organization they, they had a reason to. We're slow. Right. Why not look at ourselves now? Perfect. Yeah. What does every company in in the middle of any transformation or if you see something that's wrong? How can we make these changes and not impact business? I, I would say that you're you're seeing that changes need to be made because you've seen an impact to your business. Mm -hmm. So right. what are you saying? Are you saying you don't want to make changes that could possibly impact your business more? Yeah. Because I think, as you said, it's it's an overtime thing, yeah. and if if you have business issues over time, there's no better time to change than yeah. today. Now change is hard, but. Why, why would you drag your feet? Because yeah. you're afraid to lose business? I don't know. The wild thing about this is he just told us, he sat on this for 10 years and got less and less comfortable over the course of 10 years until the pandemic hit his business with an 80% drop in revenue. And he absolutely had to respond. Like, I, I think, like, how, how lucky, how lucky he was to survive, first of all, like as a business, right? But how lucky he had that opportunity. When, when, when we did our podcast about John Cotter's leading change, mm -hmm. like the first thing in leading change is to, you have to create a sense of urgency. All right, the burning d need. To help you drive the change. That, hey, we need to change. Why? Everything's great, economy's great, we're moving, free money, 0% interest, whatever. There's no urgency there. The first step is driving a sense of urgency. He didn't, he, like he had a lot of help driving a sense of urgency because his whole business was tanking and very luckily he could execute the changes he wanted to. I mean, you, you also could argue, like you're the CEO, like who else is gonna execute the changes? But but again, he just spent a couple minutes qualifying. We were going into this, big IPO and I had all these people and then the businesses ballooned over time and I feel like I, you know what I mean? On one hand, one side of me will be like, well, you're running the business. You can change it anytime. So, yeah, who's stopping you, know you? you? Yeah, right, exactly, who's stopping you? But on the, other on the other side of it is the side of me that has worked with founders and stuff where they feel the weight of like any change I make, if I make it in the wrong direction, these people are gonna lose jobs and they have families and stuff like that. So I, I, on one hand, I understand what he's saying. On the other hand, like a, yeah right that, i had that attitude in the back of my head, back of my head but they did make it through could, could i devil's advocate you there absolutely so you said he waited he sat on this for 10 years i might say he gave it a shot for 10 years maybe he tried he just he stayed quiet saw it was a little bit away i mean but he at least gave it time because you can look at change and say oh this is a bad direction but if mm -hmm. it's the if it's the first month that's not long enough to actually understand data but then he saw 10 years and he goes 10 years is enough and again i'm only speculating here but maybe he said i wait 10 years and we're not getting a lot of traffic on the site so we have an ability to adjust yeah now is the time yeah. and so now we change yeah. i don't know i think it's a multitude of factors so that's part of it and also the other part of it is he suddenly found himself in competition with others over those 10 years that's one aspect of it the other aspect is because of the pandemic he felt there's a burning need to change because it's threatening the survival of the company at right. that point the enterprise agile coach in me anyway wants to say well if you're the ceo of the company like i know you're you're tracking financials and you're tracking the product metrics and stuff like that. Where's your board for transformation in your organization? Where is your organization gonna be five years from now? That, that comes what, next. What is, what's the culture of your organization that you would like to project? And can we put those goals on the Kanban board and try to implement strategies and test things, organizational things, to get to where you wanna be? What kind of communication structures do I want? What kind of, quote, reporting structures do I want my, I don't want to be a, a pyramid hierarchy anymore. What do I want to be now? Well, I, let's experiment, let's figure it out. Now I need some kind of transformation Kanban or backlog or something where I'm trying my experiments over time to try to change, actively steer the culture. If you don't have that work transparent somewhere, how, first of all, how you know it's going to be done. And second of all, who is steering your culture? Or indeed, how do you know what needs to be done? Because it's not visible, right? right? right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they, need a, they need a unified voice from a leader. So he's the CEO. He's in charge sure. of this. And he's admitted, uh, I, maybe I didn't re recognize it for whatever reason. Somebody's shifting it, as you said. Somebody's shifting it. Yes. And I've seen it in my experience before. I mean, you, you just literally have to sit down with the CEO and say, hey, they need a leader. Right. They need to know where they're going. They need to know what you want to build. Right. And it sounds like in this case, if you were to try to ask that question or him as the CEO, he wouldn't be able to articulate to you where you're going other than 
we're just trying to make as much money as possible. And yeah. we do that by maybe doing a couple of things, right? But we don't really have a strategy here. There was no strategy. There was no measurement. There was no, are we there? What's our North Star? There, yeah. I mean, there might have been words on a wall somewhere probably, but that's probably about where it ended. There was no step two, three, four. Yeah. There was no measurement against it. That's that's the crazy part. And you, you that's the where it starts is like, hey, you all want to do Agile? You want to do Waterfall? You want to do You want to do Kanban? Pick something. Mm -hmm. pick, pick, it, pick it and lead. Lead it, make a choice. Mm -hmm. But don't pick something and then disconnect and say, you all go do. Yeah. Because they need a little bit more than that. They don't need hand-holding or micromanaging, but they need more. A leader does yeah. a little bit more than that. I also think that he needs, uh, he needs help from somebody right, in order to, to make this happen. The Gino Wickman Traction book, the, the book where the EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating, operating system, system yeah. is from, it, 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 it lists out that like any company, especially small companies, they have a visionary and they have an integrator. And the visionary is a source of ideas and the integrator, they have operational skill and they make it the happen. The doer. Yes. They have a Steve yeah. Jobs and a Wozniak. Woz is the doer. Yes. Steve is the visionary. That's, that's, that's the Apple, EOS book. We're back to Apple. Yeah, that's the EOS book. That's um, awesome. But uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's kick back into uh, this session. So and so I said, there's a simple rule. If it's not on the roadmap, it can't ship. And it must be on one roadmap. So we had this giant exercise. We put every single thing on one roadmap. Then I said, we can only do 10% of the things on the roadmap. That was a wet reckoning. So I said, we're only going to do a you few a really reckoning? big things. Something. We took the very best people. We put them all in a few projects. And then I said, we're not going to do A-B test, unless A-B test. A-B testing is abdicating a responsibility to the users. And so we're going to do a little bit of experimentation. But if we do A-B testing, you're going to only do it if you have a hypothesis. If B is better than A, you have to know why B was better than A. Otherwise, we're stuck with that for like the next 10 years. So, I got right click. It's a wet reckoning. So, so yeah, wet reckoning. That was so weird. I don't I'm know. Gonna, I'm going to start using that. Not I'm sure know. what a wet reckoning is. That's but the title. Wet reckoning. So I, <laughs> I think it's a. I think it's a teenage problem. Anyway, why did I stop the video? A B test. I realized when he was talking about this that like there's like a Silicon Valley nature of A B tests that whenever you implement a new feature, you have to do A B tests regardless of whatever. Like some of this is in his little bubble cultural that the rest of us don't really do like the, the rest of us i would say the rest of us in the real world like we're just happy to do an a b test i was gonna say yeah I, yeah yeah he, what That's i've been in companies like, that never a b test why yeah. what yeah. i get it he's like we're doing too much a b testing yeah. too much of a good thing is a bad thing but yeah. there's a lot of companies that fly by the seat of their pants and right. they couldn't tell you how to do an a b test and you can be like well you've been in marketing here for 10 yeah. years well what's an a b yeah. test it's like well these these guys these guys a b test every single idea like that th that's 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 in their culture, you know. So this is part of this is a cultural thing, and I just wanted to highlight it to skip past it to be like, hey, that's just what they do out in Silicon. Yeah. Like it's like when you're cooking, there's like a little bit of salt, not too much salt. Like how do you know when you're adding too much salt? Well, you just kind of feel it out. Like that's that's how A B tests should be used. Yeah, say, he was sipping right. on the sauce yeah. about every five yeah. seconds rather than saying, let's let it cook for a little right. bit before yeah. we do another test. Yeah, let's let it simmer. And so we are going to focus, number one, on shipping things that you're proud of. If you don't want to put your name on it, you don't ship it. The designers are equal to the product managers. Actually, we got rid of the classic product Apple's management okay. function. Apple didn't have it either. <laughs> well, let's be careful. Classic product management. Hold on. We have... We, we, we have product marketers. We combined product management with product marketing. And we said that you can't develop products unless you know how to talk about the products. We made the team much smaller. We elevated design. By the way, I started thinking to myself, who's the product manager when you design a building? The architect. We thought of designers very much as architects. And this is how we started around the company. And I started reviewing all the work. I reviewed the work every week, every two weeks, every four weeks. Yeah, right. Before, people thought that was meddling. And I said, you know what? Screw it. Like, we're going to review everything. I'm going to be the chief editor. And I didn't push decision making down. I decided to pull decision making in like an orchestra conductor. Oh, wait, wait. Hang, on, hang on, hang on. What you just heard is we got rid of the traditional product management job. We decided we needed product marketers. And we merged product managers with product marketing. That the, so that's the important things that he just pointed out. So if you can't if if you can't talk about a feature, you can't implement a feature. That that's basically what he just lined out. And when I when he says talk about, what he means is, if you can't inform the marketing department, the sales department, market it throughout the company, externally, outside of the company, basically if you can't put your face 
to the feature and talk about it and sell it, then you shouldn't be in the product manager spot. I have no problem with that. And we, we've we had podcasts, I think maybe Stormy's very first podcast, or a couple, like her second podcast or something like that was about product owner and product manager, like tearing yeah. their roles apart. Yeah. When you tear the product owner role out of the product manager position, what he's describing is what you get, in my opinion, mm-hmm. is you get a, a group that just interfaces internally to the developers and decides what to work on and kind of like sort of architects things and figures out solutions and, stuff and and can't really externally talk about it and can't write marketing text and can't talk to sales and can't figure out how to sell things, doesn't participate in pricing, in marketing, that kind of stuff, doesn't write text that's seen by customers. And uh, uh, honestly, I'm kind of with him on this one. I, I, I think that you should be doing that. It's a it's a slippery slope. Yes, I I would agree the way you approached it was right. It's it's, but what it's what you see a lot is, is people, they want, they see a good product owner, manager, whatever you want to call sure. them in this situation. And then they want to try to duplicate them. So then they get bogged down. Well, then what happens is those people either get promoted and then, or they get overwhelmed and then you have to split them. Well, what ends up happening? That's when the product owner becomes just a proxy. They're just a proxy. Right. They're there to, to right. fill a role answer some questions, but they can't even make a decision. Sure. They couldn't tell you anything. They couldn't, that's why he's saying what he's saying. And I think he's not wrong. His analogy was great. Product managers are like the architects. I, I would agree with that. I would be careful using the word architect in a technology yeah. setting because I'm like, they're not coming up with service oriented architecture. Right. What they're doing is, is they're designing the features of the house. Why? They're designing the features of the house that is better for you, you as the user of the house. Mm-hmm. That's what he's saying in this context. Mm-hmm. Is this great? Yes. It's not to say that you, you have to have a designer that is a product manager. I think the message that he's saying is that a product manager needs to be design focused, design yep. thinker, right. needs to be thinking through, not not get requirements, don't do that. What does the user need to see in order to either A, buy this product, or yep. B, have a good time in this product, right. with this product in yep. it, whatever. Did he not also say though, towards the end there, that he basically took decision making closer to him, right? Well, I, I, I mean, I am willing to give him a pass on, I'm, well, first of all, we'll listen to the rest of this yeah. section, but I'm willing to give him a pass on that for now because I don't know what employees he has at this point and what their what their level of experience and their backgrounds. So I'm willing to give him a pass on this one because maybe what he's saying is I need constant demos of the application. I need to be walking through the application every week to, to explore like a user would. Like, like walk me through the new user experience every week. Like if I was a director of product or for an organization, I would want to do that every, show me every week. I have no problem, like 45 minutes every week, just checking that your new users have a good experience. Like, is that too much time to ask? I don't think it is. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I, like that, that's, that's, that's the equivalent of what I'm hearing right now. That's what I think it is. Yeah, and the timing, this contextual. We haven't heard this, but I'm hoping that his new product marketers, mm-hmm. as he called them, are actually customer facing. They, actually speak with customers yeah. and not just inward facing. That's that's where it goes down. I mean, he's he's getting a lot of principles from Apple, so what I'm assuming is th- these these product marketers can sit up in front of a crowd and own it like Steve Jobs right. did. He never did, like, and you'll see this all the time, is when he's showing off his product, he's not showing you APIs. He's saying, hey, users, this is really cool. Let me show you when you when you turn. I mean, he's actually walking through what it's right. like for the user, but you don't often get that, and it's, it's great that he's going to that effect. So I'm thinking that the fact that it's more design focused means that the user is in mind, but the whole pulling in the decision thing, maybe, maybe he's going through retraining. Maybe that's why, but I would also ask is like, is make sure you have a backup plan. Like, is it like you, you want to take that week long vacation? Well, you can't. And he may say, I don't ever take vacations. Well, that's great. But, mm-hmm. but God forbid something were to happen because if you're the only one that can make a decision in the company, set the expectation of like, this is not the end goal. The end goal is not that I'm going to make every single decision here. Mm-hmm. The end goal is that I'm making the decision for right now because in the future, I'm going to trust that you all make the right decision. Yeah. So I want to try to help you. Sure. Yeah. Like, you know that's, what I mean? It, yeah. it comes off yeah. really bad at that, first. I, right. it, it sure does. And, the, but that's the way I'm going to frame it for now until I hear the rest, uh, until I hear him out. I, I, I kind of see this as like, Hey, I, the, like as the executive that says, uh, add me to all the sprint reviews, just like invite your stakeholders the way you normally do it, but also add me to them, uh, uh, add me to them. And also the executive actually commits to actually being there at all the sprint reviews to kind of engage the best business leaders that I've ever been coupled with 
come to a sprint review, they give the actual user user time to expand and talk about what they were doing. And then they won't give direct feedback. They will ask the user feedback about what they're seeing. Like, hey, don't you think when you click this, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been easier if maybe you could have gone directly to there? Or maybe if you had a button that brought you straight to the screen instead of clicking around, oh, actually now you mentioned it, you know what I mean? Like that kind of questions, rather than like, you should add this, or I don't like that this yeah. works this way, you know, that kind of stuff. I don't know him and his personality. I, I've not like watched, I'm not really dug into his background. So I don't know. I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt now for the purposes of getting through the rest of this. But yeah, yeah, you're, I'm on the kind of periphery. The periphery was my calendar word for the day. I'm on the periphery of being like, mm, I don't know where you're going with this whole being in the loop on all he's like all decisions. Through, uh, he's busting through right now. Created was a shared consciousness oh. of like the top 30, 40 people in the company. And it was like one neural network, one brain. So all this is what we're doing while people say we're gonna go out of business. Something remarkable happens. Not only do we not go out of business, but in the last three years, we went from a company that was break even to last year, we did nearly $4 billion in free cash flow. And sure. Money. It, it was like, it was totally crazy because like, that is actually more free cash flow for every dollar earned than Apple or Google. And the crazy thing is we did that by not trying to make money. But there's something amazing. A designer can do more than move pixels on a screen. A designer can design a company to have fewer parts. So my competitors, are some of them are former CFOs. And yet, as a designer, we were able to imagine a way to save more money because you could design a company with fewer parts, fewer projects. Uh, oh. I'm sorry. Were you throwing shade on accountants that run companies? Plenty of companies are run by accountants. Or a former financial people, yeah. yes. plenty of companies are run by that, and 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 uh, I feel he he just hit on something that probably should be a completely separate podcast in and of itself. Is like when the accountants take over the companies, you begin this very slow, long slow. road to decline, and then that's where all the disruptors kind of come in and start picking apart pieces. Yeah. Of but the crazy part about it is like the the accountant. The, when when does the accountant make sense to hold it when they make it all about dollars and cents? Because the accountant is going to be focused on dollars and cents. That's sure, what yeah. they've done their whole career. Yeah. He's saying, I'm a designer, so I can design an org chart. When do you need an accountant to be focused on dollars and cents? You need them in the early stages when you're in startup where money is everything. You don't have excess capital. I, and then the redesign of the organization, you need that later on. And he's saying... Some companies are there 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and now they need it. I mean, I get it, they go through lulls, but he's talking about his peers. He's trying to talk about people who make $4 billion in cash flow. Do they have to be money obsessed? No, they really don't. So a designer can redesign and look at a organizational chart and design what works. Mm. Maybe. Yeah, but. Maybe, yeah. I'm, I'm, That's I'm, what he's saying. I'm a very squishy maybe on that one. I would rather the financial function be delegated to the teams and have enough finance people to train the teams how to do the finance function, which is a real, like that, that, that concept in like agile software development is like nowhere. Just, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, just, just no way. Like, give me yeah. enough accountants to support my teams and tie them back to the business and do the finances of the business on a team by team basis. But uh, again, now we're, woo, we're, we're, we're talking deep. crazy talk now. <laughs> so we're deep. Design is much more than a department. It's a way of thinking about the world. And I think there's a whole new generation of designers that aren't just gonna work for engineers. They're gonna sit alongside engineers. They're not just gonna be told what to do by product managers. They are gonna be helping drive the product. And some of them are gonna to choose to drive companies because ultimately what everyone wants is to have a product people love. And so that's kind of our story of what we did. Again, some of this is cultural. Like you, you, the, the product managers tell the designers what to design. I mean, hey, go design this this style page or this clip art or whatever i think about it i want to say clip art because i love that term clippy rather than like deal with them as partners like the designers are not equal to the product managers and the you know, just in the same way that the developers would not be equal to the product man like you probably should fix that in your organization where they're just peers collaborating together to design the best products but it sounds know? like in in his particular scenario he's going the opposite way really at least that's my take on it. No, I think right? he's he's lobbying to move away. I think he's saying that they had had this kind of imbalance where the product manager kind of told people what to do, oh, I see. Yeah, and they're yeah, yeah. and they're and he's lobbying for the designers to be equals and that kind of stuff. So, and I would add one amend his statement on the one thing is 
everybody wants a product that they love. I would say everybody wants a profitable product that they love because if all you care about is right. love, right. I see people walking away from products that they love sure. or that people love all the time because it's not sustainable. It, sure. it, at the crux of everything, I mean, it's there's there's still a dollar and cent component to it. The, the love is not the endless and all be all. And he may mm-hmm. say that goes without saying, but yeah. you, you kind of didn't really say that. It's like designers can do that. You gotta have money at the root of it, but as long as you take care of it, then I don't You're think good. he. I don't think he does. <laughs> I don't think he does. You don't think he likes money? I, I think he does like money. You're like no A B test, and people are like, should I applaud? Limited. Limited. I don't, I don't know. We, then, do a, uh, we do a control treatment. It's not I, like we don't. Well, I thought you were we don't like advocating responsibility. Good. Have a hypothesis. Think by first principles. And metrics are not a strategy. A strategy is not growing. That's not a strategy. Yep. That's not a strategy. We all want to grow, but a strategy. We talk about putting your arms around the entire company. We try to have one small design team that sees the entire product. And this is critical because if you have an idea, it's like pulling on a string of a shirt. If you are contained to one surface, then you've got to get the entire company on board. And so that's why I think this integrated approach is so important. Also translated to design thinking. Like why design thinking is important? Because if if your whole company supports one product, even if that product is like some interactions are API and some interactions are integrations with the products and some interactions are mobile apps, some interactions are desktop or whatever. I don't even know if they really have a desktop application. Yes, you do need to make sure that the whole system is evolving together and, and you need to, whatever sets your roadmap, roadmaps, roadmap needs to take into consideration the whole system. Well, he's talking about systems thinking right now. That's, I mean, he's not using the term, but that's what he's that's that, talking that's about. Right. That's right. Yeah. That's what I was thinking about when he said that. It was like, yeah. this is systems thinking. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, and, he, and he said, uh, what, what did he say? Metrics, uh, metrics aren't a strategy. I, I like that. Right, yeah. I, think that's, I think that's awesome because yeah. m- metrics support your strategy. It's yeah. not your strategy. Metrics are the measurement on how close you are to either achieving your goals or sure. hitting your strategy. And I like that. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably going to yeah. steal that one. So I, I agree yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, you're not going to make any friends with metrics. How yeah. do you push for a design driven strategy? There's something interesting. I noticed lawyers never have to justify their job. Like, well, I'm a, or a CFO doesn't have to justify like why you need a CFO. And there's very few functions where people feel like they have to constantly justify their job. And designers seem to constantly do it. Designers <laughs> seem to constantly justify their job. Oh boy. I think that designers are probably a little too self-conscious. I think that designers should have a nerve and they should ask themselves like, what are we trying to solve? And be a little less compromising. I don't mean to be completely difficult inside the company, but I think that design as a function has probably ceded too much ground. Hmm. You know, again, in many companies, like architects don't seem to have this problem because there's like a thousand years of history around that field. But we designers, a lot of us came late to the party. Web designers came after software designers, and a lot of the great designers stayed in print and other areas. And so these entire functions like product management got built before a lot of the design department came in. Make no mistake, product managers are critical, but they shouldn't be doing the job of designer. And so I think that it's really important to really like focus on a number of principles. Before he goes off, I, I do think that product managers do the designer job in the smallest companies. Like the smallest companies don't have designers. They have product managers and the product managers have the, or or actually they might not even have product managers. They probably have founders who do this job because founders do every job. They have, yeah. 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 They have a specific vision for their company. Correct. Yeah. So so I'm, I'm sort of on the fence about what he's saying. I'm, I'm kind of, one, I'm going back to it's like, wait, didn't you said you were getting rid of all the managers and putting the designers there? So it's like, in in your scenario, you just created where the, the product manager is the designer. You you just created that. Is is I if I'm understanding what he said before, he is get rid of the project managers. I'm going to put designers there, well, and it's well, like, well, they're 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 peers in his organization now. Uh, they're peers in his. So, what, but, but again, his organization is lucky enough to have for every product manager you have a you're coupled with a designer peer. Yeah, in, but he's but he's not wrong. Is justifying job? I think that's that's an accurate assessment. Sure, I could apply that to a lot of different. There's positions a lot that of positions that right, right. that have to do yeah. that, and there's some that like testers often have to justify their job, often. but they will never get rid of a tester. There are other jobs where you have to justify your job, and they will get rid of it. High Capital One, looking mm-hmm. at you. Yeah, right. Uh, they will absolutely get rid of your job, and it's it's not wrong if you want to take 
and lead your company down a path, like you can't fault someone for saying, hey, we're gonna restructure how we are and yeah. these jobs just aren't part of our new structure. Love it, you're a leader, you make a change, you stick by it, you're a leader, that's fine. But in his scenarios, I, I don't like the analogy of architects have been here for a while, so they've got it and now, he keeps saying the word nerve. By the way, we're at we're at count six. He keeps. I think he's up to over ten for this whole thing. So just make sure there's a nerve count on the thing. But he <laughs> drops that when he can. That you need to have nerve. Everybody can go to bat for their job at the table. Yeah. I just I don't know if they make that decision. And just trying to say you want to have more nerve, which is kind of me be more steadfast or more stubborn. I guess stubborn yeah. in your ways. I don't really think you're gonna make that call. I don't think you're gonna win more friends that way. What you're gonna have to do is come up with the people who make that decision, you're going to have to use metrics, numbers to justify your job. So you're not fighting by right. being stubborn. You're going to have to meet them where they're at. Right. And you're going to have to start talking dollars and cents. If we do this feature, we will save X amount of time, which translates to X amount of money savings. Right. And you're just going to have to do it. Being stubborn is not going to satisfy that. Yeah. You got to meet them where they stand. All right, we're, we're off of pause. I think that designers should not be just focused on surfaces, they should be focused on user flows. I think that you should only ship something that you're proud of. Don't test something until after you're happy. Because ultimately, the artist in you should first and foremost make something for yourself. And when you love it and you're proud of it, now you're ready to put it out to somebody else. I think that designers should be trying to simplify every single thing they do. And then I think if you're in an organization, you have to use their language and explain why it benefits them. If people love our products, they're going to want to buy more of them. What is the goal we're trying to do? Well, the goal is we need to grow this thing. Well, why do we need to grow this thing? Growth is not a goal. Growth is just a direction. Like, like that can't be just the goal. And so these are some of the things. Sh shots fired right there. Growth is not a goal. Woo. That's so many companies are working in that way, though. Oh, boy. And, and growth growth doesn't equal profitability. Yeah. Some people outgrow themselves, which creates a mountain of debt. I, yeah. I agree with it. Yeah. It's a metric to track something, but you do need a goal outside of that. Yeah. Growth should support whatever your goal yeah. is. That's uh, Jim Collins' Why the Mighty Fall. We did, a, we did a podcast on Jim Collins' Why the Mighty Fall, and that was one of his things, the, the, the undisciplined pursuit of growth. Like for no other purpose than we want to grow. Single-minded. Like, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. I mean, honestly, it comes down to ego of like, we want to be, I don't want to be in charge of a bigger boat or whatever. Like, uh, why? Well, why? I mean, isn't that, it, that's kind of what Musk did with Tesla. At some point, they wanted to just keep growing. And then when he was asked, hey, why do you have, why are you eight, 10 quarters in the red, I think it was? Mm hmm he goes, we'll figure out how to become profitable later. Right now, we just gotta get out there. And I mean, like, yeah. it, did it eventually work for him? It does. Not everyone has that capital coming in. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a unique position, but also it's any of these Silicon Valley folks that are out here, like that's their thinking. Their thinking is, we're, we're here to corner a market and be the first ones and corner the whole market and be, and be the the verb or noun whatever <laughs> like they, basically you don't yeah. you don't say i'm going to make a photocopy you say i'm going to xerox that's right right you like the, uh, you use the company as the noun right and so the best thing for engineers and the best thing for pms is to pair them with great design from the beginning because a lot of companies design has become a service organization Mm. Design should not be a service organization unless that is explicitly the intention of the CEO. And that means it's not your job to catch things, to stop them before it goes out. It means it's your job to work from the very beginning that design challenges technology and technology inspires art. It's a perfect harmony from the very beginning. I'm going to stop him there because, it, again, he's back on his organizational design diatribe i think a data science the same way because da data science is like a skill even if you wanted to hire a half a dozen of them and embed them in all of your teams i mean where would you even find that many people on the market you know what i mean that, like good people on the market with experience you probably would have a real difficult time trying to do it so i completely understand why companies get in the mode of saying like well i'm going to hire one ui ux two three ui ux people and park them over here in the ui ux department and then when you need them, we'll dedicate them to your team for like a sprint or two. And then they'll knock out all the all the plans up front and all the wireframes up front. And then you guys can do all the design, whatever, and then we'll send it to the, you know what I mean? Like that. Classic shared services cl model. Classic. It's absolutely yeah. classic. Yeah. And it's the age old thing that I always hear is the shared services model. And then they go like, hey, UX person, you can drop off the call. Mm -hmm. Hey, I love our UX designer, but you gotta be careful with them. They'll they'll run your costs up through the roof. Right, yeah. and it's like, are they really? Or are they yeah. trying to save you money? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, hey, I would say that it's probably a lot more expensive the other way, but right. 
that's a different topic yeah. probably yeah. than this. But I, I do like what he's saying with the harmony part because what, what what's the analogy that we always see is a seat at the table. Yeah. Like technology often doesn't get a seat at the seat level table. Mm-hmm. Mm, you, they get bullied around a lot, but they still have a level. Most companies don't have certified design or like C level design officer sure. or whatever you want to sure. call it. Like they just say, well, that's part of technology. That's part yeah. of marketing. Yeah, the pro- they're, that's exactly right. They're either part of technology or they're part of marketing or they're part of uh, product. Yeah. The, the, one, one of those. They're parked. They're parked somewhere. I envision in this organization they're parked under the CEO because it's so important to the CEO that design is elevated to that level. Now, again, I've not. I've done no research for this podcast, so I'm. I, could be completely wrong, but it feels that way. You know, well, the idea that they're equals. You right. Know. So some of these companies are now coming up with titles like uh, Chief Customer Experience Officer. Sure. Yeah. You, you kind of wonder if that person has to have a design background or at least have design thinking. Let's yeah. say. Right. One would hope. One would hope. One would hope they would have empathy and at least talk to the customers because they have customer in their title for Pete's sake. Yeah. Well, the I mean, the intent of a position like that is someone who is concerned about the entire user experience, front to back, but also reality. Yep. Can you break down more for us the way that you see marketing, design, product, and engineering all working together in harmony? Exactly. So, but before, exactly. <laughs> what a weird, <laughs> what a weird segue. Exactly. Like, weird. I like this topic because I have a theory that 90% of the people in the job product management either don't do pricing, marketing, participating in sales, and strategy. So, the point being that you're on the product development side of the house, not on the business side of the house. So, while, while you are the, while you're supposed to be the business rep to the team, in actuality, it's like they, they sliced off this product owner little piece and that's what you do and you're, you know, well, that's that's a developer thing. We'll, we'll talk to the develop, our developer guy. And at that point, aren't you just like a you're project a manager, manager of a, yeah, but aren't you like a some, some, some slice of a project manager to the development team? Like you're their rep that connects you to the rest of the business. The more he talks about this, the more I feel like somehow his company has segmented the product managers into this weird project management type of role where they don't do this kind of stuff. None of this at all has hit on anything that's value proposition based, Mm -hmm. which which you should have to justify for anything that you build. It's got to do something for the, is it, is it experience? Is it revenue? Is it a time save? Like it's, it's for a reason and nothing is about value proposition, but you have to understand that. I understand that most of the, what he's saying by designers is most of the stuff is user driven and that will translate to the other stuff so we don't need to worry about it. But I never have seen that from product product managers. Like you said, strategy something, at minimum, give me a value proposition. Why, why are we doing this? Can you, can you at least justify that in terms of this? And just be broad. Right. It's a cost savings. How much, I don't know, but it's a cost savings. All right, let's. Let's move forward here with this. Uh, okay, so the first thing is we try to have a roadmap, and I am the keeper of the roadmap as CEO, and I think generally, usually the CEO should be the keeper of the roadmap. Our roadmap is typically about three years out, but it's very fuzzy. It's like those video games where it gets fuzzier the further over the horizon. But I have a pretty good idea of what we're shipping between now and next November. So we'll have a release in November, we'll have a release next April, next November, and I have a pretty clear picture. And then about two years out, it gets pretty fuzzy. Now to be clear, it changes. And I update the roadmap every single week. Now the long-term roadmap, the near-term is hopefully not changing that churn, but the long-term is constantly changing. Sorry, I, want, I meant to criticize his. I set the roadmap, and I set the roadmap for a couple of years. And well, no, you don't. You don't. You do not set the roadmap for a couple. You set your strategic goals for a couple of years out. Objectives. I, yeah. I certainly believe you set your objectives for a couple. That's that's not a roadmap. And and you could, you could we could quibble back and forth for the rest of this podcast. But he sets his goals the way he wants to set his goals, and the employees in an organization, no matter what their job title is, product manager, whatever, they pull it down and say, "Yes, sir." That's we'll, right. You know what I mean? That's mm-hmm. cool. Cool. Awesome. Mm-hmm. I, again, I see no point in setting goals two years out that in the next six months you're going to revise and throw away. Like I just went through my backlog today. Today went through my went through my roadmap, not my backlog. I went through my roadmap today. I took all my stuff in my later category and I went over every single thing in my later category just to scrub things to be like I don't want any aging items in here. I started setting up like alerts for things that are a couple months old just so I I don't have stale stuff on yeah, my. Yeah, those ro- things age like. Vegetables left out 
out of the fridge. They age like they go, fine milk. Oh, man, yeah, exactly. Because your 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 market's susceptible. Like wait, two years out, you think you actually are going to understand where the market's at? Two years, I've I've wasted all this time setting my goals. Two years out, and then guess what? I'm going to roll back in another pandemic. Your goals now are shot. I know, You've just I know. wasted time. I know. Yeah. So which, it's, it's waste. Which he, he just outlined. It's probably too quick for him to go into context with any of this, but he probably really does say, hey, my two years out stuff, actually one year out stuff probably for him. My one year out stuff is like up in the air, maybe I think, I suspect we might need to be in this business area, but I'm not gonna put any thought or planning into it at all. If we were to, to dig into context here, Probably that's what he would tell us. Is like the two year stuff is like things I know I want to expand into. I really would like to get there, but if it doesn't happen, no one's going to cry, and we haven't expended any effort at all on it. So if it goes it's like away, epics. He yeah. just made his epics. And exactly. He knows what it is. And exactly. Then, and it's great because I was nobody could see it, but I was clapping when yeah. he said a roadmap is constantly changing. Not the near term stuff, but mm-hmm. I'm the yeah. the three months, six months, and I'm like, hey. Because, because again, sometimes people don't get product owners or managers that do that. They right. they slinky effect. They set right. it and then they move it and then they adjust it. And it's right. like that slinky effect doesn't work. But if you're constantly changing it, good. You're reacting to factors that you can't control that you can see, and you're providing value in real time based on what is being dictated, which is great. Yeah. You can measure the health of organization by the relationship between marketers and engineers. And in most companies, marketers are like waiters, and engineers are like chefs, and if the waiter goes in the kitchen, the chef yells at him. And that is not a great relationship. We actually like to start a lot of product development, not just with design, but with marketing. Because our marketers, we want to actually have a vision and to figure out how they can tell a story. Then product marketing, again, product marketing is product management plus outbound marketing. It's a smaller function. It's an extremely influential function. They will work with the designers and us to establish like, what is this project? What are the goals? What are we trying to solve? So like, let's say we launch this product, Airbnb Rooms. We noticed the original Airbnb was really slowing in growth. And we wanted to figure out how to revive it. And so it often starts with insight. And the insight was people are nervous staying in the homes of other people. I'm turning him way down on the recording because I want to speak over him at this point. Because I I like that he has a couple of prepackaged stories that that integrate both his organization and the application. And he's ready to roll them out on demand when he needs those prepackaged stories. I feel a lot of people that are scrum masters, product managers, product owners, people learning the role and stuff like that. I guess even designers. In order to break through to the leadership level, you really need these prepackaged stories ready yes. to go in order to stand out as you know management slash leadership material in these types of organizations. I mean, he has them ready to go. You know what I mean? He's practiced. But he's the probably problem with design many, language systems sorry. is you should he's design probably practice these whatever many you want and then you put it in the design language system. But then we started noticing that people had bad photos. So hmm. then we built an operation to take headshots of 40,000 people. If you were a designer in a corner of an app, It'd be hard to convince the marketing department to spend money to take photos. But when you're integrated, you can start to do this. Again, he says integrated, I hear systems thinking. Uh, it, 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 it's, if you're one product manager, one designer, hell, even one, one developer. If you're one developer on one team in a tiny little corner of a tiny little program, maybe one person riding on a choo-choo train, right? It's hard to, to convince people, hey, if we spent a couple dollars and cents taking great pictures or holding events where professional photographers could take pictures of the people that, that are our, our hosts, I guess. I don't remember what they yeah, call them in the, the, in the application. Maybe we, we have, in certain cities, on certain dates, we hire professional photographers and people can come in and get their headshots and, and it costs us this much money, but we can make this much on the back end. You would have no avenue to, to do something like that because that's, that's not a product thing. That doesn't go into the software. And, and how are you gonna do that you know, when, when your voice is like, hey, shut up, kid, get back to, get back to, to, to pounding out screen designs or whatever. That system syncing never comes into play when you're all the developers over here and all the designers over here right. and all the testers over here. Which and is what we see all the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, absolutely. And the and the better thing is, is if, if like a product manager should be able to do that. If we did this, here's right. how much it would cost, right. but we could save this by the, and like, th- you go to the marketing department with that and they would, they'd probably look at you and go, how do you know what my costs are to make that determination? Right. 
I don't. I need your help. Or, no, you're not going to get that information. Leave. And or, like they won't give I'm it to you. I'm too busy. Or worse, <laughs> actually, oh, or actually, they don't know. Stay actually, your lane, bro. You know what's even? You know what's even? I like that you snuck bro in there. Or worse is I'll take that back to the budgeting and I'll let you know because smart people take care of the budgeting numbers and we're trying to keep that secret. That's a long form of no. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's the thing is if you expect a value proposition, if you want someone to tell you why should you do something you're going to CFO or marketing or anything like that. They're going to quantify it with numbers, but if you're not making your numbers visible or at least helping because yeah. you have to have somebody else do it and you say, we're going to take it back and figure it out, right. either you don't know or you're hiding something. Right. But you would, you owe it to your design thinkers right. to try. If you want to get your employees to think like business owners or founders, you need to treat them not like children. You need to treat them like business owners or founders. And let me tell you a quick story about how we improve the product. So we recently created this thing we call the Airbnb Blueprint. And I was inspired by something Walt Disney did in the 1930s. He was making this movie called Snow White. It was the first feature-length animated film. And it was so long, he couldn't keep track of the film. So he created this thing called the storyboard. And that's when we realized, well, what if we do the same thing at Airbnb? So we storyboarded the end-to-end -end journey for guests and hosts. The rest of us know this as a user journey map. Anybody who really wants to understand how their users move through the application and how to plug a new feature into the normal user experience should have a journey map like he's describing. But let's listen to the rest of it. Every single screen a user sees, put it on one wall. It turns out there's 150 screens. Then I said every user policy, every time you call customer service, what policy you're referencing? It turns out there were nearly 70 user policies. And then we went through or like 20 million customer service yeah. calls. We went through hundreds of thousands of social media posts, tons of workshops, and even our first-hand experience. And based on that, we created a prioritized map and systematically tried to fix our product. And I, I used to tell a team, we can't do new things unless we have permission. And we don't have permission working on new things until people love our core service. And if they're complaining on social media and they're calling customer service, they don't love our core service. So we have to get our house in order first. The storyboarding, like understanding your user's journey through the application and what the most painful points of the journey are, and then fix them until your core offering is as good as it can be before you worry about scaling and adding a million features and adding a thousand buttons that no one's ever going to see. Well, a good journey map lets you also see things like uh, what are the value subtracted, opposite of value added steps, right? The steps that the user has to sit there and the stress, click through. Yeah, right, yeah. Those things you can remove, yeah. right? AKA waste mm -hmm. in the lean mm -hmm. uh, world. It's the same thing that we already know. He's just got to, he's just put a new kind of label yeah. on it. Well, I, I've also seen, I've seen, uh, journey maps through an application that have a stress level that goes up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, like yep. I've seen those I've tools, seen too. they take a bit of work to do because there's not really any tools that do it easily. But uh, I think it's really cool Like you're applying for a loan and now you've got to like add all your documents or whatever, like the stress level goes way up and be like, mm -hmm. oh, what do you mean I got to find my whatever tax statement from X years ago or what? the stress is going to go up at that point. So you try to make that as easy as possible That's right. in your application to maybe add some features that make it you know, helpful. Oh, when you add your W2, it automatically picks all the numbers off of it and populates a field so you don't need to do things yeah. like that. You yeah. know what I mean? I think being a designer is like holding 5,000 ideas in your head, some of them contradictory. And we tend to call this intuition and we get really nervous because sure. it seems somehow not systematic. But I actually think a lot of great design comes from deep understanding of a problem. And so you're trying to absorb as much information as possible. When I joined Y Combinator, Paul Graham said, make something people want. Well, who knows what people want as well as designers? Not many other people. I think that is a core a good, value a nice, that I we like have that. to that's the world. Finishing, and I, yeah. I just think more designers should rise up and start companies. That's a good finishing idea is designers know what people want. How do they know what people want is because they have, they have all the skill to get in front of users. They understand to put the user first and to put the user's opinions and the user's views at the center of what they're doing. I mean, they're trained to do that. They're trained to do interviews, that kind of stuff. As opposed yeah. to assuming, right? Uh, running A-B tests is, is in a way a certain assumption that he was kind of calling out. But uh, I, I like that, that he wrapped up with that. Yeah, yeah that I, think, I think that that should have been the biggest thing is designers can run companies and why is because they're often more in touch with the user than mm -hmm a CFO, a CTO, yeah. they're more user obsessed. So why should you not have 
that be the case? It's it's almost like I, I think it's the the publicly traded company. What would you rather have? You know, the the board is going to tell you what they want. Do they want a CEO that is money obsessed mm-hmm. or user obsessed? Yeah. And it's hard to quantify to that board that a user obsessed CEO is a good thing and can and often make you a very profitable member of the board, right? Mm-hmm. It can increase your shareholder value. But I I like his statement. I wish he would have hit on that a lot more is like yeah. designers know the user, but oftentimes you have to ask that simple question is, are we building this to make a stakeholder happy? If our users love this product, is the stakeholder happy? Or if the stakeholder's happy and the users hate it, are we still successful? And mm-hmm. sometimes we're just here to make that suit thumbs up us yeah. because we don't even care if the users don't like it. They don't care either. Yeah. So you have to ask that question yeah. because if you if it's all about customer satisfaction like he's talking, yes. Some companies don't operate that way. They mm-hmm. don't ask those questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I wish he had said that earlier because I kept asking, are these designers customer facing? Yeah. We didn't know. The main reason I wanted to highlight this video on the podcast, number number one was, of course, the, the clickbait. Like I was like, it's not what the clickbait is never is, right, yeah, right. Not, but but the other thing is like it's it's a organizational design talk disguised as a ui ux talk that's right it's hey talk to your customers bring them in be customer centric like actual customer centric be design centric being design centric means you're going to be following what the customer wants you're going to be following the customer really closely because you're going to be checking with them and and asking and, and getting feedback and uh, your company shouldn't be like all the X people are over there, all the Y people are over there, all the Z people are over there, or the Z people. He called that out real early, and it's like, oh, I, d- I didn't like the way the company was designed because I realized that we should be putting the customer closer to the middle of the experience and all kind of swarming around it, and and we should all be peers rather than all the UI UX people work for the product people, and the product people say, go go build me some clip art. <laughs> I don't know why I keep Clippy, like I feel Clippy's like I'm 80 bad. years old when I keep it like build me clip art. And like if you're gonna have one tiny little component team over here, a complicated subsystem team under the team topologies. Hey, it's another podcast you can check out here. Team topologies. If we're gonna treat UI UX as a complicated subsystem or design as a service where we just throw something over the wall and say, hey, go figure this out for us. And they send it back and we have no idea right. what their thinking was. When it's they customers aren't in that picture. And then uh, one last thing is know why you're building something. If customer satisfaction is of importance to you, then that's great. Yeah. I mean, own up to it. If you're just trying to make somebody in a suit who wants an app built for them and the people that work for them, mm-hmm. you like say it's like internal and they don't care if the users like it, then that's fine. If they only care so much that a user like it, then that's fine. If they 100% dive in and want the users to like it, then you need to open up that channel. They need to be able to talk to the users. You need to be user obsessed yeah. like he's talking about. It's just it's difference. Yeah. It's 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 knowing why you're running the company. So I I want to th- I think that he's probably saying that without saying is that at some point they weren't user obsessed. They were technology obsessed and they had 10 different departments doing everything they wanted. Yeah. They went back to user. Right. User obsessed, right. which is great because yeah. What did yeah. he say? Four billion in cash flow. Yeah. Yay. I mean, then yeah. Those cleaning yeah. fees have to go somewhere. That's true. Yeah. Uh, definitely, it's an org design topic for sure. I mean, he solved this issue by by changing the org design. L- luckily, because I mean, I think of how many organizations that that were not Airbnb that did not have so much cash flow that were not well known in the market that COVID hit it destroyed their business model and then they just disappeared. Mm-hmm. Whereas Air- Airbnb could take an eighty percent dip in revenue. And again, back to the John Cotter leading change, he could lead them through that change and come out on the other side, still solvent as a company. Yeah, he certainly felt that fire under his seat, so to speak, right? Yeah, Cotter's first step, right? Felt the burning desire. Felt burning to somewhere. Make, yeah. Seek a doctor. It's, it's just too long. Hey. <laughs> if you like this, hit the subscribe and like button down oh. below somewhere down here maybe let us know what else you'd like us to talk about that's right and if you would like there is arguingagile.com you can send us questions and we may do a podcast about it in the near future or the far future or the not too distant future <laughs>